Podcast. Welcome everyone to the Film Vault. That is it. I'm Brian Bridger, we're your hosts for today, the Flick Fashions portion of the entertainment. We're bringing movies we've seen in the past week. I think we're going to line up on a couple of these, Anderson, and uh, uh, we'll uh, give you our thoughts on the movies, some movies we've seen in the last week. Uh, Anderson, how the heck are you? Fantastic, Brad, Brad. How are you, buddy? It's really none of your business, but I'm doing very well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We actually spoke uh, a little bit before the program, and uh, I'm going to be honest with you, Brian. I, it didn't feel right. It felt way too friendly. Really? Yeah. Fuck yourself. Mm, thank you. We're and back. Uh, let, let, let's get back. Let, let's get into our skins. Let's get into like you know, uh, the, the shit that we do where uh, we're mean to each other. Yeah. <laughs> That's our shtick. It, it is shocking, though, like how, how nice at least I am to you what? before the mics turn on. And oh, yeah. Then, uh, and then, you, then you, you, the quick pivot. Yeah, I don't know why I do that. I don't know why. I don't know why. Speaking of things I don't know why I do, I don't know why I continue to say, for literally for decades now, uh, false things such as <laughs> E.T., uh, they were going to go with M&M's for E.T., but uh, the Mars company said, no, we, we, we can't. That's all true. That's all true. So then Reese said, hey, we'll make some candy that looks like M&M's, and uh, they did. That's, that's absolutely untrue. And not only did I say it recently, like last week or the week before, but I heard myself saying it uh, over 10 years ago on the Orange Couch Days uh, episode, which uh, I just posted okay. for. Or, uh, our, our Patreon you members. Never it's just embarrassing that I, it's it's literally o- over a decade I've been spewing misinformation. So uh, oh, apologies. Funny. I remember as two two weeks ago, or whatever it was. I think it was a top five most '80s movies, maybe or something like mm. that. Uh, anyway, you had said that outrageous claim, and I'm glad that outrageous. I'm on on record as saying I don't think that's true. I don't think they made mm-hmm. Reese's Pieces. Are you so happy about that? I am. Brian? Actually, Are you so happy? I'm I'm I'm, mm-hmm. I'm swelling up a little bit, not uh, north of the belt. <sighs> The anger. See, this is this is why Brian's not always this you much of a. You started it. Mm. Well, anyway, somebody told me that once, and that's the problem with me. And hey, that's the problem just with life in general, uh, especially as you get older. You, you learn things, you hear things, and then that just kind of becomes fact. And uh, it's the true. It's, it's it's true with people too. Like uh, I've noticed it both sides, going both ways. Like I've I've met people, and then I think that they're a certain way. And then I learned that they're not that way, that they're they're different than how I had initially thought of them. And then I won't see them for a while, and then I'll see them again, and I'll immediately think, oh, yeah, they are, like, the initial way that I thought. It happens to me all the time. People think I'm a prick, and then they get to know me a little bit, and then they think I'm okay, and then they don't see me for a while, and then they act like they think I'm a prick again when they first see me. Like, my my uh, my wife's sister, for years, I could be back and forth, and I, she'd go, oh, yeah, I didn't realize. I, I always thought you were an asshole, but you're you actually a nice guy. You have to reestablish yourself as a and nice guy. And then I have guy. to reestablish, yeah, like, over and over and over again. So it's just old dogs, new tricks. And uh, you're like Phil like, Connors. Like having... You're like Phil Connors in uh, Groundhog Day. You know, everyone thinks he's a jerk, and then he, uh, mm-hmm. he has a change of heart, but no one, no one's there to know it. A whole lot of truth to that Groundhog's Day, you know, Brian. Really, really it's philosophical. A philosophical, philosophical piece. Yeah, really, really. Very philosoph- philosophical movie. It's a think, it's a think piece. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, let's do a little fan flickshon. Thanks to our boy Mitch Burns, who puts this together for us Jesus, every single jumping week. Jumping right into it, Jesus. I mean, what else you want to do, Brian? I, I got I some know. things I, to talk I, I about. Nothing, and the listeners. I else. I Here's how it goes. Brian Raleigh on Twitter uh, watched Psycho Gorman. I know a number of you so watch Psycho Gorman. Here's Brian Raleigh's uh, take on Psycho Gorman. It reminded me a lot of South Park in that a lot of South Park episodes center around the joke that kids rarely take supernatural threats seriously. The girl's definitely an Eric Cartman-level sociopath. Uh, agreed. And agreed. Bye. Okay. Okay. Bye. No, she's great. E, yeah, she's a sociopath. Uh, is she's she great? Is she though? Oh, she's a yeah, killer. She I mean, wait, wait, wait. I'll, I'll meet you halfway and say that I think all kids, especially you know, seven-year-old girls, or how old is she? Nine Brian, or something. Brian? I think they're all basically sociopaths. I I can agree with you there, but I'm tired of meeting you halfway. Okay, I'm tired of you going. Know come to down. my come to my side. I'm tired of it. Yeah, why don't you just come to my place or I go to your place and we call it a day? Like you know, let let's stop meeting. In the middle, because uh, I don't meet in the middle, Bray Bray. And she is a sociopath, and she's much more than seven. She's like 11 or 12. And I can tell you, uh, the little girl in Psycho Gorman, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, she's probably going to be CEO of a company. All right? No. Yeah. Achiever. Earner. Socio. Because she's she's the same age as her brother, essentially, and uh, very different people. Now, the brother's older for sure. A little bit, barely. I don't know about that. He might be younger. He's significantly older. 
He's not significantly <laughs> older. All right. Ewe on Ewe Emporium on Instagram, not to be confused with Bill's Emporium. That's a callback. Oh, oh no, Bill's back. <laughs> Ewe Emporium on Instagram. Has any, has any human being, and I, I'm including like Christopher Nolan or Stanley Kubrick or Quentin Tarantino, gotten more mention? I'm including Miss Movies. I'm including Diana Vandy Camp. Has Geo. Any, has, uh, Geo, has any human being gotten more mentions on this show than Bill? Aside from you and me, <laughs> has been Bill. Yeah, I mean, he's up there. He's probably top 10, but I'd say... That's outstanding. Uh, considering we thank the uh, Mitch Burns and uh, and 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 everyone uh, at the end of every episode, we do mention the ad for the yeah. So it's a good point, I guess. Bill Bill Emporium Bill's Emporium <laughs> gave us a, a review years and years ago, and it wasn't like on iTunes or anything. It was on his it's own obscure. site or something, or isn't it? Very it was, obscure. How do we find out about it? I can't even uh, remember. That's a great question. Did someone someone had, someone must have alerted either 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 someone alerted us to it or I have a Google news, news alert for the film vault so if, of if course anything is public you do. every once in a while I guess I'm gonna go mention us of course you do Brian it's probably smart you probably have one for bri bri I have one for bald bri I have one for oily cakes bri <laughs> Oily cakes. <laughs> All right, here's what you. So, for those of you who might not know what we're talking about with Bill, Bill's movie emporium or something. He gets way too many plugs. He he wrote a vicious. Uh, uh, Isn't he even uh, still around? I gotta look it up. I have no idea, but it was like a hit piece on our show, and he just kind of uh, he dismantled the show and us as, as as individuals. And for whatever reason, I think maybe Logan brought it to us, but we had a lot of fun with it, and we <laughs> we talked about him at length for years to come. All right, so hey, this is not Bill, as far as I can tell. This is Ewe Emporium. His main on criticism with the we, was that we dropped way too many names by being in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, he acted. He he suggested that we're like typical Hollywood types who are constantly dropping names, <laughs> like we're that. I mean, we're a lot of things. We're not that. At least I don't think we're that. Are oh, we that? No, oh, no. Bill's Movie Emporium has not had an update since 2017. So, sorry, guys. But uh, the picture atop the um, atop mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the the review or in the, and the picture atop the website is uh, the last one, the most recent one, 2017, October, Ooh. is a movie yes. that the, the very last movie I cut uh, from my top five cold opens. Weird. I watched this very. Oh, that is weird. I watched this very scene an hour ago. Brian, do me a favor. Write it down, make a note of it, because I want to know what that movie is. Well, I, I guess I could just go to Bill's Emporium. I don't want to do that, though. I don't want to give him another click. Uh, write it down. Tell me tell me what it is when we get there, when we do the uh, the episode, Top 5 Movie, uh, Cold Opens, yeah. later on this week. We'll uh, where was I? I was, uh, yeah, I was somewhere. Not Bill's. You're telling some other Emporium. Yeah, I know, but you were, uh, ah, whatever. Okay, so. You're uh, saying the emporium. name, not Bill, but this Emporium. Yeah, and then you cut me off, That's and you true. were on his site, and then something else came to mind. No, I, can't help, hmm. I can't help you there. Hmm. No, you can't. All right, Iwi Emporium on Instagram saw Unhinged, a mindless cat and mouse chase movie with a female lead so obnoxious, I was rooting for Russell Crowe. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Brian, but it wasn't that bad. Maybe if you thought of it as a music doc about the relationship between Liam and Noel Gallagher, you might have enjoyed it more. No, I, I'm on board with uh, whoever this is saying it's uh, not that bad. It's not the worst movie I've ever seen. It's just not good. Mm. He described his, his, remember his entire description of the movie was negative. Hey, I, re I remember what I was going to bring up. No. Uh, I was going to say that we are not name droppers. I don't think. I hope not. And then I remembered a conversation that you and I had on air not that long ago. Uh, involving a restaurant that you went to and you, you you enjoy telling me about the people that you see there and kept asking me to guess which restaurant it is that you go to. It, it was so gross, I so disgusting. You, you have, I have yet to, what, to get a guess from you. Uh, I understand that it's it's somewhat of like a tongue-in-cheek thing you're doing, but at the same time, a lot of it's not. A lot of it's not. A lot of it is actual bright. Did I describe mm. the part where the door opens and the fucking flashbulbs like flood the place with light? That's yeah, crazy. Yeah, you. You, it's not that crazy because it's a place where douchey celebrities go when they want to be seen and they want paparazzi. Because if you're a celeb and you don't get enough attention by just being a regular celebrity, uh, and you have to like, you have that thirst, that hunger for, for flash bulbs in your face. That's a good point. Yeah. If you go to a place that you know, there will be, it's inevitable. There will be it's a, paparazzi yeah. there at all times. Right. There's plenty of places. LA is a large place. There's plenty of places you can go. There's certain celebrities we never see. Or there's certain celebrities you see a lot, and then when things happen, you don't see them anymore because they don't go out to those places anymore. That's true. 
James Franco. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a good point. Although he was everywhere. Like I'm pretty sure that he waited my table one night and was in the movie that I saw that night. And I think that he he taught an ex girlfriend of mine busy, at UCLA that that afternoon. Busy guy. And now he's nowhere. All right, uh, here we go. Worth the movies. Worth the view movies. I should say. Worth the view movies on Facebook. Saw. I care a lot. What a freaking good movie. Totally worthy of the view. Maybe a second one. Dinklage and Pike are amazing. This is a must. So, uh, yeah, this is a movie that I previewed on Cinemadix uh, a few weeks ago, and I wasn't sure if it was going to uh, be good enough to watch, but I've been hearing good things from everyone, from my buddy Rand to uh, Worth the Movies, Worth the View Movies on Facebook, and my own mother sent me a text last night saying, you should check out that uh that movie, I care a lot. I can't believe it was based on a real life story. Wow. For those of you who might not know, it's um, Rosamund Pike, The Dinklage, Tian Wiest, uh, Isaiah Whitlock Jr., she, as well as Macon Blair, Macon Blair, uh, who, of course, we like from the uh, Jeremy Sonier team. Uh, so, yeah, uh, excited. It's about uh, somebody who's stealing money from the elderly until she meets her match. And you got to imagine that her match is Dianne, 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 how much Dianne, 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 Dianne Wiest, and uh, Rosamund Pike. So excited about that one. Okay. Uh, Elsa Gonzalez is also in this. She it's, plays Fran. It's E I Z A. I don't know how it's pronounced. I, Isa. Isa. It? Isa. That's right. Sure. Isa. Are you, Isa? Are you got me, Isa. man. Isa? Maybe Isa. I knew an Isa. I knew an Isa. Ah, anyhow. Isa? Just Isa, I think. Okay. Isa Mor- And then finally. Isa Morales. Finally, Mitch watched. Sia's directorial debut, Music, so you don't have to. You may have heard of Music, Brian. It was uh, got a bit of controversy uh, not too long ago, uh, recently actually, when it was uh, first released, because uh, she used, uh, it, it's about people that are on the spectrum that have autism, and she used actors rather than people who are actually on the uh, spectrum, who actually uh, have autism, uh, which is one thing, if it's a character or two, I think, uh, you know, it depends on how you're using it, but apparently this movie is all about autism and their experience, first firsthand oh. experience, and she didn't use uh, any actual autistic people. So Probably it was not. frowned upon. Probably However, not. the Golden Globes didn't mind and uh, gave her a couple nominations. And here's what uh, Mitch has to say. It is atrocious. The Globes deserve to be canceled for giving it two nominations. It feels like the two main characters literally named Music and Zoo, or Zu, Z-U, live on fucking Sesame Street. That's, uh, that's Mitch's take on it. Okay. I can only assume it's, uh, it's our own Mitch Burns. And then finally, Chris... Torgers, Torgerson, 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 Torgerson on Instagram Easy. finally watched op, finally watched Operation Odessa. Fuck to the S. I was only 20 minutes in when I thought to myself, I love this fucking documentary. The story is incredible and the subject is subjects are fascinating. So uh, sweet. sweet. Thanks, Mitch Burns. For letting us know. Brian, have you seen that Operation Odessa? I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, of course. Uh, we I think we flick fest it on the same episode. I mean, you I think you assigned it. To me. I saw it on your recommendation. Either you assigned it to me or we uh, saw it oh, together. I do remember now talking to you about the horrific poster, which um, does not help its cause. Now, that movie, uh, Operation Odessa, was directed by the same fella who directed uh, the, uh, the, the Night Stalker, which uh, recently aired on the old, was it? Uh, fuck Netflix. I think it was the Netflix. Yeah, it was very good. I really enjoyed that Night Stalker. Uh, Tiller Russell is his name. Mm-hmm. And Tiller Russell has a movie that just came out since we last talked to you called Silk Road. And Silk Road, I'm doing my own flick fashions here, Brian. Do you want to actually intro flick fashion? I was just dovetailing right into it. <laughs> you really segued nicely. Cold open to flick fashions, if you will. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. We're going to confess the flicks we've seen in the past week. Uh, we'll call it flick fashions. Anderson, you might be happy to know you and I both saw The Silk Road. Oh, tight. All right. Well, then why don't you set her up and then uh, I'll fill her in. I'm good. Filler. I just talked a lot filler. with the uh, fan flick show. Filler. Tiller. Tiller. Filler. That's we'll fill, stretcher we'll, retro. I'll, I'll till her in. Uh, the Silk Road is a 2021 film written and directed by the aforementioned Tilly Russell, uh, director of Operation Odessa. Uh, stars Nick Robinson, Jason Clark, a man, uh, excuse me, Alexandra Ship, Jimmy Simpson. He might know as McPoyle from uh, It's Always Sunny. He was just in uh, Unhinged, and uh, he is uh, much more fun here. Uh, and Paul Walter <laughs> Hauser, who uh, a much needed shot in the arm for this movie, comes in about uh, a third of the way, halfway through, I would say. 
Uh, 55% of Rotten Tomatoes. Disappointing score, but I uh, decided... What, what is it on fi- Rotten Tomatoes? 55, 5-5. Five, five. Hmm. Decided it seems about right to me. Decided, <laughs> decided to dive in. I would agree. Decided to dive in anyway. Uh, this, as far as I can tell, Anderson is a rental only. Uh, this is a movie you must rent. Uh, the Silk Road. I don't know that I would encourage you to do that. But let's talk yeah. about The Silk Road. Let's talk about uh, Silk Road. Let's do it. Has a cold, I was excited has a cold about this open. One. It does. It starts with a, uh, a stakeout. And uh, and we, it's one of those movies where it's a framed open. We kind of see the, the uh, lead up to the climax right. of the movie. And then we get thrown three years back. And we see how we got to this point where uh, the lead, who is the guy, the kid that uh, created Silk Road back at uh, in the early 2010s, I guess. Uh, we see how he got to this point. And... <sighs> Right off the bat, okay. So I was curious to see how Tiller would translate to uh, like a regular, like a straightforward narrative, because uh, he he makes a hell of a documentary, and I was I was rooting for this movie, and I was excited about it, and I, I, I don't like to talk badly about it, but some of the choices that he made just did not work at all. Yeah. One being a, the, his overuse of freeze frames to end and put a cap on a scene, yeah. he, which he did repeatedly, which felt dated and out of whack and and uh, very distracting. At best, felt like an homage to a certain era of movie making that was just kind of didn't need to have. But the rest of it didn't feel like an homage at all to anything. I agree. In it, its, was, it was really out of place. In its genre, like it, it was lit. I think one of the worst things about it for me personally was the way that it was lit, the way that it was shot. It it looked like clueless. Like it felt like I was watching a mid nineties comedy. It was so overlit. Everything was completely lit up, which is fine if you're shooting, you know, a talking head documentary or recreating some se- scenes. But like this, I, I felt like yucks were always about to happen, but they rarely did. Uh, yeah, it's funny when you mentioned that. I was like, you're like a problem with how it was lit. I was like, I don't remember it being particularly dark, but you're right. It was, uh, it was very bright. It was, it was very bright and soft, and it felt, it just felt like a, like a like a comedy. Like it felt like a, like the kind of like a rom com, like something Brian would love. Like, how dare that you? That would have, uh, that would have Ryan. Uh, what's his name in it? It's I, I Ryan Reynolds, uh, movie star. How dare you? Uh, that's funny. You okay? So two things about that. I think. Okay, so two two avenues uh, uh, diverging from this uh, this point. Number one, so you you're you're famous on the show for uh, uh, your claim that uh, director's first and most important job is getting good performances out of his actors. Uh, the, 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 this would these were not good performances. This the, this the, this felt amateurish uh, at times. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, However, there were a couple bright spots, I'd say. Yeah. And I think Jason Clark was one of them. Uh, yeah, he, and if you watch it, good. if it's Jason Clark's movie, then that's, you know, you, you give it you give it some extra points there. Uh, I don't think it was his movie. It wasn't. It was the uh, the lead character. Now, they had to get a lead character who the lead actor had to be not, not likable. You didn't want them to, to well, like the guy. It's kind of like the same as the social enough. network. He wasn't unlikable. Yeah, I was thinking but about that. he wasn't compelling. I was, I, think, I, was thinking, compelling. I was thinking about that. I was like, he should be, like, this should be like a Mark Zuckerberg type who, I don't mean like, change the character but i mean like we hated we didn't like mark zuckerberg we didn't like jesse eisenberg's portrayal like it was masterful mm-hmm. and here I, so that's the other avenue i wanted to go down which is like the lead nick robinson i did not recognize him from anything i should look him up and see what else he's been in maybe something i've seen maybe some, something i have not uh he is in this film remarkably charisma free you love that term. Jurassic World uh, is the first title that he comes up in, and he is uh, looks like he's pretty far down the list there. Yeah, I would. I did not recognize him. He looked like the guy that I really cannot stand from Baby Driver. I don't even like to say uh, his it's name. Awkward. That's how much I just – stop it. What's wrong? He was like a, yeah, he was like a poor man's version of him. Uh, I dislike that guy so much. Oh, I dislike that guy. Like I look at him and I, I just get chills. Like, ew, he was, he's the same species as me. Ew. Ah, I guess he was one fucker. of the kids in Jurassic World, one of the kids in the bubble or whatever the thing that was. Um, I, I, he was his and the, the, by extension, the love story or the relationship. I just didn't care. I didn't believe it. It felt like a commercial, like for gum or something. Their entire their entire relationship felt like a thirty second commercial that I didn't give a shit about. Uh, 
yeah, I mean, there was something here that's a great story. We've seen it before. A lot of us have seen the documentary about it. There's a few good documentaries about, uh, on it out there. We've we've read the stories. We know the general beats of this story. And I really like the storyline uh, involving Jason Clark, where it's kind of him getting the better of these millennial um, computer laptop fucks. I agree. And, I, I like. Uh, I however, liked, he I was like the element a of- despicable door kicking cop too who you know there's plenty to hate about that guy yeah he wasn't he was hard to root for i i liked the idea of him as the cop fish out of water like he you know he used to be on this one department he kind of washed out of there uh went to rehab and as the story opened, it was tropey he's being transferred was, to like cyber crime but he doesn't know anything about right. it. he doesn't know fucking shit about computers he's like he, an old blue collar he can't guy. get he can't get his computer to work. It's constantly, I think there's a virus on this thing. And he's constantly calling his tw- his much younger superior in to fix the virus. I, I liked all that. I liked how that ended up. And there was something very satisfying about all of that. Uh, but it's just not enough to, to hang your hat on and say, this is a movie that, that people should go out and see. I'm glad I saw it. And there's certain things that I will always remember, I, but I don't know if that's going to have the same effect on everyone else. Jimmy. I like Jimmy Simpson was a, a lot. I enjoyed his character. I enjoyed Paul Walter Hauser. I like anytime Paul Walter Hauser is on the screen. Yeah, I was going to say Paul Walter Hauser might have been the, the the highlight of this movie, and he's not in the movie very much at all. But whenever he's on the the screen, he plays this uh, typical computer hacker geek guy who lives with a ferret by himself, and uh, he's <laughs> bad things happen to him uh, by Jason Clark's hand. But I liked I liked the beats of the story. I really did. Uh, I don't think the script is to blame here. I think it was just the the overall direction, and it's just kind of meh. Isn't it? Um, Do you ever get the different? Do you ever experience what I experienced with this movie, which is like you don't like it, but and then it it gives you like an like an extra little kick in the ass on the way out the door. You're like, oh yes, of course. No wonder I didn't like it. Like the little like like crawl afterwards. I don't know how much we can say, but there's a crawl afterwards or like a little title card that says basically none of the none of the um, things that uh, the uh, Silk Road inventor hired people for actually ever happened. And I'm like, yeah, but he, he yeah, but he hired them to do them. I mean, that, that's, that's the crime right there. Oh, like they're almost like in defense yeah, of him. It, it like he, like he went like, to jail like, for these has, things. He has a life sentence for the, with no chance of parole, even though none of the things he tried to do actually ever happened. He's like, yeah, but right. he certainly tried to do them. Yeah, I mean, I have no no sympathy for him at all. And Ross, you know what's oh, funny Ross is my wife, Ulbricht. Ross Ulbricht. My wife had an idea of who Ross Ulbricht wa- was before the movie, and uh, she now realizes that he probably belongs where he is. She thought that he might have gotten kind of yeah, the raw a, a raw deal there. But no, I after watching the movie, I'm like, I have no qualms with uh, him rotting in prison. Uh, but so Jimmy Simpson also another highlight of this movie, and it's here's like one little thing that I'll always remember, and it's uh, he's very intense in this movie. He's also part of the New Guard. He's uh, younger, like uh, all he's all he, we're, we're not hunting people here. We're hunting IP IP addresses, right? He's that guy, and he's very intense though. And uh, Jason Clark has to call him up to uh, get. Uh, essentially find out how much i don't want to give too much away but he, he needs to know how much time he has before something happens and J- jimmy simpson just has no time for this old dinosaur of a cop who's bugging him and jimmy simpson's in an airport like he's on like a jetway and he's like you know just walking very fast and he's in the middle of you know finding that ip address and busting this silk road guy and he's answering uh, jason clark's questions and he and jason clark asks one final question and it's just the, the end for jimmy simpson jimmy simpson goes no i don't know guy and he hangs up the phone and goes fucking guy <laughs> and it was just so perfect it was enjoyable. Do you remember that i, I thought for some reason he was like he basically was like nope and hung up or but like or it was some version of that you know you could see you could see him the frustration after the hangup and it was probably added in there by jimmy simpson just doing his own thing which you know good actors especially comedic actors they do they throw in their own shit all the time and it was just so perfect he put he, he hung up his blackberry put it in his pocket fucking guy <laughs> <laughs> i forgot about that uh, almost worth the price of admission not not worth the price of admission but almost it's on, no no it's okay so it's basically anderson on the uh level of like a okay tv movie um but here's my question for you uh ross albrecht is coming ross albrecht that'd be something uh tiller russell is coming on the uh Crow show in a couple of days to promote this film what do i say nothing well i have to you speak play some sound effects no you don't okay that's a good point it'd be weird you're hired that's to play sound drops point. i think i'll play i'll play my drops of yours 
Uh, I would just uh, focus in on the things that you like. I mean, I've had to do uh, roundtables plenty of times. And uh, if, if you see some horrible movie, you talk to them about the movies you like. You, you, you ask them about Operation Odessa. You ask them about Night Stalker. You ask them about uh, some of the actors that we've already talked yeah. about in this one that you liked and what it was like working with them. I mean, there's plenty of things you can talk and to this, them about. And this, this, we should be clear to everyone. I don't, I, don't, I don't think that you or I think this is a terrible movie. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's, 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 it's below average, but it's not bad. It's interesting in the sense that this is a director that I, I am I'm head over heels for uh, as far as documentaries go. I saw Operation Odessa within the last 12 months, and I, I just I, I love that movie. It's it's one of my favorite documentaries that I've ever seen. And, and the Night Stalker uh, limited series is fantastic in the way that he used 3D models to recreate the crime scenes. It was it was riveting. Uh, and it was it was really interesting to see what this guy would do with the uh, and this might not be his first but as far as i can tell with his imdb page it looks like it's his first narrative feature uh ask him a question like what it was like what what the main differences and challenges were because obviously he had some you know <laughs> leave that part out uh, though obviously he had some yeah just you don't ask him like you don't say that part but i mean it, it looked like a, an ad a lot of it looked like an ad for craig uh, uh, captain morgan's or something you know <laughs> there was a sheen to it it looked like like a like an ad for like millennial booze that's interesting yeah, I, I, there was a sheen. The, the, that's funny you mentioned that because I was thrown often by whenever, I don't, maybe this was a choice, but whenever they showed um, Nick Robinson, the main character, the Ross Albrecht uh, character, and uh, and his girlfriend, it was very, the sheen on it was almost like a Noxzema commercial. You're right. It was, it was as though they were advertising for like skincare products. And that, I mean, that's uh, ultimately up to the director, you know, so it, he is to, to blame there. I'm, I'm purposely not looking up who shot this movie because I don't like to shine a light on things that I, you know, find only negative in. So I'm not doing that here. But uh, let's let's move on to something else that was shot as though it was something else. Brad? I thought that was, though it was something else. It's a movie that was assigned to you. Oh, uh, yes, indeed. Uh, Anderson is speaking of. First Cow, First Cow is a 2020 film directed by Kelly Reichhart. Uh, I'm pronouncing that right, Reichhart. I should do the Anderson thing. Is that Reichhart? 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 I think it's Reichhart. Uh, John Magaro stars with Orion Lee, Scott Shepard, Ewan Bremner, and Toby Jones are in this movie. Uh, 95% are on Tomatoes. This can be streamed over at Hulu, which is what I did. Um, Anderson, this is presented in 4-3 aspect ratio. At least mine was. I have to assume that's how they all it all was. That's right, Brad. Uh, this is, um, that's, her, that's her thing. This is a movie that if it was bad, you'd call it slow, but it's, it's, uh, it's loved by the critics, so uh, they, they would call it deliberate, deliberately paced. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, opening credits. It's a challenge. It's a, it, 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 a challenge. The opening credits. So they, sometimes movies, you know, throw down a gauntlet and they let you know what they are, what they're going to be like, what, what you're what you're in for. And uh, this one opens with the opening credits uh, uh, roll over a static shot of a ship passing, and then there's uh, uh, digging in the dirt. A dog digging in the dirt, and this is um, mm -hmm. silent, uh, aside from, I mean, no dialogue, and uh, you're like, wow, eight minutes has passed, and I'm not quite sure where we're going with this. And let's talk mm -hmm. about First Cow. But you do now, right? Yeah, yes. Like you, you, now that I've seen the film, Anderson, I have a much better idea of where the whole thing was headed. And it's like a, it's, it's a river that we're looking at where this kid and his dog uh, or grow, uh, dig up a, a skull, a human skull, and we see this giant freighter that does not belong in that setting. Like it, it's, it's, it was kind of remarkable that that giant freight like vessel was going through what looked like a, a small river. Mm. And you found, uh, you know, you found you, it you remarkable. Know, it was a little bit remarkable. I'm used to seeing those things in the open ocean. I've never mm. seen one cruising down a river like that. Uh, you know, but what, what the hell do I know? Uh, but th that's the only thing that's really letting us know that it's modern day. Cause like you can't really tell from the kids clothes or anything. You just, but you realize that it's contemporary because of that giant freight. At least it's, it could be the sixties or seventies. As long as those freight, how long have those freights been around? Those giant freight. That's a boats? good question. I mean, there's been battleships since, uh, world war two. So then they're similar size and function. So you have to imagine the fifties, I guess. Mm. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm, I'm purely guessing. 
Uh, hold on. I got to, yeah. Okay. Cut off. Sorry. I'm sending someone a text. I know it's incredibly um, unprofessional, but I uh, wanted to ask because uh, a friend of mine, uh, I'm pretty sure he's, he's always telling me to watch Meek's Cutoff. Listeners have been telling me to watch Meek's Cutoff. Got to watch Meek's Cutoff. And I'm like, ah, it looks, it looks, it just looks like a slog. It, 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 four three the ratio looks boxy like it's it's made for uh you know tv in the 80s or something i don't want to watch it i don't but it turns out that that's that's her style and that that's she also made meek's cutoff and uh this is almost a companion piece uh it takes place in the same part of town uh in the oregon uh the great oregon outback <laughs> whatever you want to call it the oregon uh what is it called the, the oregon uh, uh wilderness the woods the woods, woods yeah, the, the forest? territory, the oh. Oregon territory, wow. and uh, I did not love this movie, and it's one of these movies that's kind of kind of baffles me that the critics are falling head over heels for it. However, I there's no way that I dislike this movie either. Uh, but I'm not going to come on here and tell everyone that they got to go out and get a Hulu subscription and and track down uh, this this first cow. Yeah. So the story. Well, I think is I more, think you and uh, I have a similar take on this, which is I as I'm watching this and even afterwards, I'm like I am shocked that it is so beloved by the critics. That said, I don't think this is a bad movie. It's a boring movie, but it's not. It's certainly <laughs> not bad. No, I want to call it a boring movie because I, I believe I so. The the. The gist of the story, it's slow and, and deliberate, like you said, but I, if I didn't care about the relationship, uh, I, I, don't, I, I think I might go along with Bored. And if it was a modern day story, I would definitely say Bored, but I give, I give a pass to movies that take place in this time. Brian, because that's sort of the point. We're supposed to get an idea of what it was sure. like to live back and there. They did a, and a good job of that. We 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 did speaking of good job. We did a bad job. We did not describe the Silk Road at all. Yeah, I'm doing that right now. Which which really didn't doesn't make much of a difference. But let's uh, let's get into first cow and set the table. Yeah, the Silk Road. I feel like most of our listeners uh, have an idea. Well, this Silk Road was about, about a, uh, a dark web website where you could sell drugs, and this kid invented it, and uh, ultimately got caught, and uh, that's what the story is about. All right. All right. The end. Moving on to first cow. So this is the Oregon Territory, which is the word territory I was I was uh, reaching for, and uh, it's about this uh, guy Cookie. He's a cook, and he's with these like fur trappers, I guess they are, and they all hate him. They hate him a lot. They hate Cookie because Cookie's not good at hunting. He can't he can't uh, uh, catch a squirrel to save his life. Well, his name isn't Hunty. Uh, it's Cookie. His name's Cookie, right? But he's still the one who has to come up with the provisions and the food. I mean, what what good's a cook without any food? Uh, I, I wasn't. They were hunters, right? Like they were trappers, fur trappers. trappers so yeah. why weren't they getting meat? They were. Wouldn't they have some meat? I mean, isn't that just as much their fault? So I wasn't quite clear on it's the relationship there. Skinning beaver, just fucking eat the beaver. And eat the tail, like we learned too, right? The tail's the best yeah, part, says the uh, Native Americans. So uh, we get to see Cookie, and he's kind of a more of a gentle soul, and uh, he's kind of being beaten up by these uh, these ruffians, these men's men, who uh, uh, a lot of them hate him, and there's some back and forth like uh, at times that it's almost violent and uh but then somebody else steps in we, we don't get a, a good grasp of what the relationship is beyond him but we just see it from cookie's point of view uh cookie moves on he buys some i guess himself uh, he gets his cut which isn't that much and uh he gets himself some new boots That's right i forgot about that and this is it gives you a really good idea of what kind of uh Small town uh, it, it was back then. He's, he's walking through the muddy Old West Oregon Territory town, and there's a few uh, people just kind of hanging out in front of their shacks, which is what everyone lived in, and uh, they're, they're all giving him really hard looks and looking at his boots because they all recognize his boots. Those aren't your boots. But they're not saying that, but he's already, he's he's already feeling threatened. He's being judged like, how did this guy get uh, – uh, whose boots are those? Right? Well, didn't, he, didn't he meet King Lou first? I, th I thought I felt like you met him in the woods in like one of the opening scenes. Yes. No. Yeah. 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 He did. It, it, it was pretty early on. He uh, he meets King. Uh, you're right. You're right. I should have. Uh, I should have gone there. Why don't you well, take it over? Because this is I, your I know, Anderson. I'll be honest with you. I saw it six. I saw it the day after we recorded last week. I saw it six days ago, and I've already forgotten most things about it. However, I do remember early in the movie, he sort of he's going through the woods looking for berries or whatever, and uh, happens upon a um, a a a starving and thirsty Chinese man named King Lu, uh, and he's like, "Who are you?" And he's like. I'm on the run for you know they they think I killed this guy but I didn't do it could be a could be a um, 
unreliable narrator? Could not be. But either way, he uh, gives the man, I think he has his coat or gives him water at least. And uh, the guy's on his way. And at some point, they, they reunite later. Yeah, they show decency to to one another. It's the first time we see two men showing decency uh, between each other, two human beings showing decency. And then they meet in a bar uh, not too long thereafter, uh, and Cookie is entrusted with a, a baby, a small baby That's by right. a large man. When the large man has to go out and, and fight, and everyone leaves the bar except for uh, King Lou and uh, Cookie, and then they strike up a friendship. Like, hey, I know you. You've saved my life. Yeah. What? Basically, King Lou's like, "Hey, I know you. You saved my life." Yeah, you were uh, you were the only kind guy in the in the force. So they they strike up a relationship. It was one that reminded me uh, of Midnight Cowboy for sure, which is a movie that has a very special place in my heart because of the love story that was that that movie. It's not all that often that you see like a love story between two men uh, like like this platonic love story. I should say it's not a gay love. Yeah, story. Yeah, this is but like a, unsexy broke back. If you're thinking about that. A little bit, yeah. And uh, they devise a plan. So King Lou, he's always talking about fortunes. Like a man can make his fortune out here. People have made fortunes with that. Uh, you're constantly, right, constantly, constantly, constantly talking fortune, about fortunes. Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't know the... F- oh, yeah. And, and, and when they first get together, it, it, it's just so slow. Here's an example. What, like they, King Lou invites cookie back to his place right and i was wondering like i'm like is this gonna go like are they gonna get get frisky with one another but they don't they go back to king lou's place to share a bottle right they leave the bar they leave the baby on the bar king lou's Lou's like yeah but he was entrusted uh, cookie was told told to watch the baby and he just like he's like i gotta watch the baby king lou's like the baby will be fine let's go drink so he's like, all right, we never hear what happens with that baby we gotta only hope that the baby we should also point out to the listeners that uh king lou is not royalty He's not. No, no, no. He is a Chinese immigrant who has seen the world, though. Like he's, he, he's worldly. He's, got, he's learned. Yes, he's learned. He's worldly. He's uh, he's a very likable guy, but we definitely get the sense. What's what's really interesting about this movie is we get to know King Lou really well, as well as Cookie, uh, and then we get to see how other frontiersmen uh, treat King Lou just because uh, he looks because he's Chinese. It's, I'll give you a hint. It's we, not we, well. And we, yeah, we see the racism right off the bat and it's like, it's biting. It's like, what? Like, they just don't even, like, he, he says something and they just t- totally disregard it. Like, well, anyways, yeah. uh, and it's, it's, it hurts. It hurts. And it was, uh, it was really well done in the sense that we got to know uh, both characters really well before we saw that inherent racism uh, rear its ugly head. But ultimately, guess of the oil they, case. <laughs> they, yeah, they, uh, they end up, oh, so I'm, they're in the house, right? They're in, they're in King Lou's shack. And it's probably like a seven minute scene of them just kind of quietly preparing things around, like the squirrels. Like uh, they, they got a couple squirrels on the way back and they're preparing the squirrel. The squirrels are just sitting there and they get a fire going and they're drinking from the bottle and there's just nothing, no, no words being spoken. It's just like they're playing house and like we're in that house. And some people love that kind of shit. I'm, I'm neither here nor there, but. We get to the point where there is somebody of means uh, in the town. He's like the uh, the lord of the He's town. Toby Jones. Right? Uh, I may not yeah. recognize the name, but a very recognizable actor. Yes, and he has a cow that con- that that it was imported all the oh, way from yeah. San Luis the Obispo. The first cow, like like uh, like west of the Mississippi or something. And the cow was brought up with, uh, it was supposed to be a female cow and a bull, as well as their calf. And uh, the bull and the calf didn't make it, but the um, the dairy cow made it all the way up there, and there's the dairy cow. And uh, King Lou and Cookie are talking about what King what Cookie's uh, av- uh, capable of cooking, and uh, he's explaining all the things that he can cook, but he's like, I need milk, though. And they're like, hey, well, there's that cow. Why don't we go? So in the middle of the night, like thieves in the night, literally, they go and they they steal a bucket of milk from they the milk cow. They milk the cow. And then Cookie, they milk the cow and they steal they steal the milk from the cow. And then Cookie makes these uh, things called oily cakes, which are essentially donuts. And then uh, King Lou's like, we should take these to market tomorrow and test it and see how they sell. And uh, that's the story. And things. <laughs> You're absolutely right. That is the thing, story. One thing leads to another. And... Ultimately, I was disappointed with the end, but I think we spent five more minutes on this. Part. Really? I do. Yeah. Where? It's funny because you saw it six days ago and you haven't thought about it since. And it's, it's, uh, I've seen it, th- I saw it three days ago and I thought about it. I don't want to say a lot, but I've thought about it. This is one of these movies that I will think about and I'm never going to Wait, you want to do a spoiler discussion on I will this? never forget. 
Oh yeah, oh, yeah, wow. yeah. Because I have ideas for where I would have liked it to have okay. gone. And <laughs> We're going to talk think that about there are people. That happen. I think there are people that are listening to this right now that have not seen it that would love this movie. I, I do. I think this is. I think this scratches a certain niche that a lot of movie lovers have. Uh, I am not one of those, but I definitely appreciated this movie and I liked it. It it's not threatening to crack my top twenty of the year, but there's a lot that I did like about it. Yeah, I, it, it's a three star movie for me, which in a lot of a lot of instances, like such as this one, is my way of saying, yeah, good movie. Can't really quibble with it, but at the same time, I don't plan on revisiting this too many more times in my mind. Not not made for you, Brebre. I don't know. It's just, it was really slow, and f- frankly, it was just kind of boring. Like uh, the, well, the yeah, story that's... we told takes two hours yeah but there's some poetry to that and it's uh, another one of these examinations of the haves versus have not it has and, its uh, moments for sure just not for me not enough of them in a row i was i was constantly wondering where it was going to go and then i finally came to a conclusion where i thought it needed to go and thought it should go and it didn't go and i was uh disappointed but we'll talk about that uh, uh, we won't spend a ton of time on it but we'll do it quick, you do little, it by uh, yourself mm-hmm. and i will be not here well, that's what by myself is by definition. Right. Bro. I, I, you didn't have drive to. It home. That's redundant. Home. Mm-hmm. I mean, that sounds grand to me. All right. Anything else to say? Actually, you know what? I will say this. It made me uh, want an oily cake. It made me want an oily cake as well. And uh, I loved hearing about San Luis Obispo back, uh, back then. I'm looking on the Wikipedia page to see... There's just biscuits. I thought that like oily cake was a thing. Like I thought that was like it became like maybe a thing or it was a a, no, a thing of the it's, day. It's uh, what is it? It's batter essentially that he made, and he they just dipped it in, in boiling and oil, fried which it. is how you make you deep fried it. That's how you make donuts. So essentially, it was a donut, and then they put honey That's on it. That's a good it. point, actually. And I, uh, th- my biggest problem with this, I. I I don't love the four three, which I've already talked about, and you know it was slow, but you, I adjust to that. With uh, if it's a good movie and I care about the characters and I'm curious as to where it's going, I, I don't have a problem with deliberately paced movies. Uh, however, it was the way that it was shot. Like it felt like masterpiece theater at times. It felt like something that you would see like on PBS on the weekend. Yeah, you're making you're making like, my for me. Uh, but no, it's it, it's my I don't like the camera movements. It, it like if you told me this movie was. Uh, written, directed, produced, and, and and released in 1983, I, I would not be like, no, it yeah, wasn't. You know I what made mean? a note of that. Uh, the camera doesn't move much. And when it does move, it seems a little sloppy. Like It seems like from yesteryear. It, f- it feels like a mid-'80s movie. It really does. It's uh, like a boring Revenant. But- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I... I, uh, I, I can acknowledge that it's a good movie, just, you know, like I found it very tedious. Mm, tedious. 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 All right, what else you got, Brian? Uh, I saw a movie that you did not see this week. I can guarantee you that. Transformers 3? Because you saw it last week. I know you hate when we do this, Anderson, but sometimes the movie's mm. good enough that we should uh, discuss it while it's timely. Mm. I'm talking about Judas and the Black Messiah. Judas and the Black Messiah. Why didn't you see it last week, Brad? I didn't. I didn't. It's a short week. I didn't have time. Actually, it was a short week. I was in the fucking snow. I barely got three movies yeah. in. Uh, and, and, and this isn't they exactly kid-friendly so, or family-friendly. You rented a place without Wi-Fi? Uh, we actually never turned the uh, TV on, believe it or not. It was, it oh, was, my it God. Was, so you're a hipster for a weekend? Pretty, hipster we, for we a weekend. We made a puzzle. We made a Cinderella puzzle, 500 piece. No, oh, you know, 300 piece. You know what we did? You know what we did a little over 10 years ago on the Orange Couch uh, episode what? of uh, Top top 5 uh, uh, Sundance 2011 preview? Hipster walking. We did? Remember hipster walking? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I guess so. Where, where? Logan and Katie went out to Silver Lake okay. hunting for hipsters for our program, wow. and they found hipsters. Yeah, I forgot about. And they this. asked hipsters questions on the street, and then we had to gamble on if they would know the I answer know. to these questions. Yeah, it's based off a Corolla game we used to play. Is it? What were they like? Transformers questions and like mainstream? It was mostly sports yeah, related. Okay. It was like who won the World Series. The the biggest one that really really ups. <laughs> uh, the question was what day of the week is Super Bowl played on, oh, no. and uh, the hipster may or may not have known it. And uh, <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, so that that for those of you who remember that, uh, there it is. It's uh, I released it on Monday, and uh, it's I don't think we ever did it again. It was supposed to be a recurring segment. I forgot that, it. I uh, think Logan was over <laughs> going out and recording people. I don't blame him. I mean, he the kid probably spent two three hours just for that five minute then bit editing it all down. <laughs> Driving down to Silver Lake and looking for hipsters. Like, they're a stake in the place out. Like, oh, that looks like a good one over there. Let's go ask him. So I saw Judas and the Black Messiah, directed by Shaka King, uh, starring Daniel Kaluuya as Fred Hampton. You mentioned that last week. Lakeith Stanfield, uh, Jesse Plemons, Dominique Fishback, Martin Sheen, and Lil Rel Howery makes a short appearance in this film. 96% Rotten Tomatoes. You can stream this for a limited time on HBO Max. Uh, I think it goes away mid-March. So get on top of it. Uh, I would imagine, I would expect this to be uh, nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars. Strangely enough, only nominated for two Golden Globes, Best Supporting Actor, Daniel Kaluuya, Best Score. Anderson, I look at this as like a good example of why, you know, I, I've mentioned more than you, but I think we're on the same page. We don't pay much mind to the Golden Globes as an actual award show. Like it's kind of a second, maybe third tier award show. I mean, the show is fun. People are drunk and they're, you know, doing stupid things and that's great. But it's, it's, almost assuredly going to be nominated for Best Picture, yet it can't even garner a nomination for a Golden Globe Best Picture, but Trial of the Chicago 7 does, and this is a, this yeah, is let's, a far let's, and away a better movie than the Chicago, maybe even two stars. Oh, good. Better. I'm glad that you, you agree with me there, because I, I won't be shocked if Chicago gets a, uh, a nomination for Best Picture, because the oldies are responding to it and the oldies still have voting power in in uh, the academy so we'll see it won't shock me at all if that one gets a nomination but with the 10 nominations that they're allowed right. to give i would i would assume that this one gets one as well but i would bet that uh chicago 7 will be uh the, the favorite over judas uh perhaps i, I, I will we'll, we'll see how the betting markets but, speak but the, the chicago 7 I, is like Brian, on the level before you, of a, before you, a decent competent tv movie and this is like a really good movie yeah, it's it's really really well done. And uh, before I we move on, like, I forgot to pay it off last week, but I definitely want to go over some of these absurd nominations on our top five episode this oh, week. Oh, the so Golden Gloves. We'll do that at the top of the show. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, I never paid attention before, but now I'm going to make it a point to not pay attention at all. Like I was I was pissed that I looked at. I, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, on they the they get a lot of big names to show up. It's a great show. It's always the hosts have been consistently good over the years. Ricky Gervais and Tina Fey and Amy Poehler and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. However, as awards, they are absurd. Like it, they might as well just be like you know giving out like you know uh, King King Queen the prom or like you know class clown or whatever. We'll talk. We'll talk. We about will it talk about it. In the next episode. Back to Judas and the Black Messiah. This has a cold open with the interrogation. Um, Daniel Kaluuya is fantastic. I always forget that he's British. Kaluuya. And he nails the accent every time, the American accent. Like, you you completely... First of all, he's speaking in a, a very specific dialect from... I guess this takes place in 1968. In late, late 60s. I'm sorry I didn't write it down. Um, there's a really cool... So, like, in a movie like, for example, The Assassination of Jesse James or Donnie Brasco or even, like, Gangs in New York, there's a cool, like, you have this leader figure, this this very charismatic, magnetic leader figure. Could be good, could be bad. Usually, you know, shades of gray. And then you have this this person who rises up the ranks, but with maybe ulterior motives or maybe nefarious, nefarious motives, perhaps intentions. Yes. And, uh, this is another one of those types of movies. And those movies are generally really good. I just named three good movies. Um, there's a great scene where I won't, I won't spoil how it gets there, but at some point, uh, Lakeith Stanfield has to, uh, hot wire a car at gunpoint and it is, uh, it's so a solid good. scene. Um, yeah. I enjoyed, uh, <laughs> this is the part where we would make the joke about Jesse Plemons being our favorite part of the movie. He is very good. Um, uh, him meeting uh, Keith Stanfield. Uh, should I go, should we, I don't want to rehash the plot of this movie. Do I? No, no. no. I mean, we just did That's it last what I'm week. Saying. We just, this is fresh in listeners minds. Yeah, just for like the one or two in the back row who were snoozing last week. I mean, it's a true life story about the leader, a founder of the Black Panthers being infiltrated by an informant for the FBI, played by Stan Sanfield. And they're they're the two leads are so charismatic and so uh, fun to watch. And they're such good actors that that's really what drives this movie forward. And the story is very, very compelling. Um, I, I wrote 
and you, let me see if you agree with me here, Brian. And I and I hesitate to even bring it up, but I wrote that the biggest problem for me with this movie is it lacks levity, ah, and it's not that kind of a story. Significantly, what? yes, right. But I mean, it didn't need levity for it to be a solid movie, and that's not what kind of a story it is. But that's the only thing that keeps it from going to the next level. And I can use something like Goodfellas, which on paper is a very, very heavy, dramatic movie about a real life event with awful, hideous crimes, right? But there's tons of levity, and I think that there could have been some room for a little more levity in this that's movie. Interesting. I, you know, I think we're on the same page because I have this as a four out of five star movie, really good. I'm glad I saw it. It's, it's impactful and I expect it to be up for best picture deservedly. Um, it's almost awesome in my mind. Like it's, it does lack that, like whatever last little bit to put it over the top. Um, I think it's the level. It could be, I think, could I, be. you know, that's what keeps me coming back to like things like, uh, Goodfellas and, uh, even, even Donnie Brasco I- to an extent. I know. I think it's a better movie than Donnie Brasco, but that had that element. Oh yeah. Yeah. I like it way more than Donnie Brasco. Yeah. But, it had the, it had but I would never want to, I, I don't have a hankering to ever revisit Judas. I agree. I'm, you know, you one know, movie I'm glad I, I saw once. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, this also has actual yeah. footage a, at the end and also a, a crawl that, uh, or a title card that explains what happened to one of the main characters. And unlike uh, the one I just mentioned for the Silk Road, this the one's Silk kind Road. of impactful. You're like, oh shit, well, that, I, I didn't expect that. That's uh, very, very uh, impactful. I won't say, you know, happy or sad or whatever. It's just, you know, it's impactful. We, uh, but yeah, we recommend this movie. We both, uh, like it quite a bit and I'm glad that you see eye to eye with me, uh, you, uh, uh about, uh, the Chicago seven, because, uh, it, it is it, shameful that, uh, now maybe we're speaking on a turn and maybe the golden globes didn't allow Judas and the black Messiah. Maybe that wasn't a part of their voting no, totally. schedule because of when they were, uh, you know, they have different maybe there's rules. A, yeah, maybe the, there's the a academy. Cutoff. And the Academy is adding those two months. Uh, so it's going to be uh, the last 14, it's going to be 14 months worth of movies. I don't know if uh, maybe Judas wasn't, maybe if it'll be, <laughs> that'd be a weird move though, if it's uh, nominated for the Golden Globes next year. Yeah, that'd, that'd be, be a truly really bizarre. Um, yeah, solid movie, guys. It's uh, it's streaming on HBO Max for uh, oh my God. just another couple of weeks. So uh, put it on your, put on your list. Oh my God. We're still, we're still, hey. We're still getting the hang of this. We're still learning. Oh, Amazon? We're still figuring this out. But uh, yeah, it's time to take a little uh, quick breather. Because you have one more movie to we're going to talk some Amazon. And I got one more thing. One and a half, to be honest. Why is that playing? Coming up next, we will uh, talk about the Amazon purchases, and then we'll get back to our um, flip fashions after that. Anderson, you ever have one of those, uh, you must have this all the time, uh, a, a word that was a big part of your life, maybe your childhood, and uh, you, 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 um, you, you come to realize, oh, that's like a real word, or that means this thing, and, and it completely takes you by surprise. The reason, I, I, I put you on the spot, I didn't expect you to think of one off your of Yeah, I got, I got one oh, for you. Oh, you do? Uh, yeah, I was hanging out with my uh, family friend. He was a babysitter of mine. Uh, he's probably 10 years older than me. He was at my wedding, but family friend. Danny's his name. And uh, he used to be at, at the house quite a bit. And I was probably, I don't know, 12 years old when uh, he we were hanging out in the bottom room uh, of my parents' house. And just he and I talking. And uh, my mom comes home from the grocery store. And she goes, hello, who's here? And I'm like, oh, I'm back here. I'm downstairs. Uh, she goes, oh, you alone? I said, no, I'm back here with Danny. She goes, oh, what are you guys doing? She's like bringing in the groceries and I'm starting to get up to, to help her. And I don't know why I said it, but I, I don't even know what, I didn't even know what it meant. But I said, we're just uh, talking about oral sex. <laughs> That's good. That's good. And the look on Danny's face is a, a look that I will never, ever forget. He was a big, mortified. Big he was probably, the, big, probably like a 19 year old, 19 year old, 20 year old, you know, guy. And he's hanging out with this 12 year old. And I said that we're talking about oral sex and he was mortified and angry. And I, I didn't even know trouble, what it meant. Today, uh, yeah, my mom wouldn't know. But yeah, if it was a different mom and it was today, yeah. If you had a mom who that, cared uh, and it was today. Oh, what are you suggesting there, Brian? Joke. 
I don't like what you're suggesting. The the word that came up as I'm looking through, of all things, our uh, Amazon uh, purchases of for the week. I'm looking at uh, this whole long list here. I'm scanning, and it's all you know. It's all the stuff that you come to expect: TVs and monitors and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of a sudden, there's a. Uh, when I was in middle school, <laughs> like you used to like we would we would. You know, if you talked about like your 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 sack, right, your nut sack, you'd be like, "Oh, my, I got nope. I got hit." Darcy, or if you, maybe you got hit right in the right, you got hit right in the se- sacroiliac. Like, and but I just thought that was like a silly way to say like your nut sack. The gooch. Turns out, Anderson, the sacroiliac is a real joint in your pelvis. It actually is near the nut sack, and it's a real thing. And someone got themselves a sacroiliac compression brace, and I. I, I grew up convinced that sacroiliac was just a funny way to say your sack. Like, like, uh, yes, sir. Like, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, Bob was a way to say, yes, sir. I wonder where you first heard that. Cause you must've heard that from like a biology major. I don't know. I just, it just spread across the, uh, the, sa- the sacroiliac spread across the playground. It does. It sounds like a creature from the star Wars. It does. Universe, does it not? Oh, interesting. It's a big ass sacroiliac coming out <laughs> no, of that cave. It's the sacroiliac run. Other things purchased on the Amazon banner that sits atop Anderson and Brian.com uh, include a Hypervolt handheld percussion massage gun, uh, 10 Aerostar clean house air filters. Uh, someone uh, wisely picked up a TCL 4K smart LED TV, 43 inches, two Streamlight Ultra Stinger LED flashlights, uh, ELAC debut Dolby Atmos modules, uh, two HP Pavilion full 1080p LED monitors, full HD, Eufy Security Smart Lock, that's like a fingerprint deadbolt lock for your door, closet made shelf track adjustable closet organizer kit, and a Lego Star Wars Mandalorian Razor Crest building kit. Uh, Excuse me, I had to swallow there. Eight washable shoe and boot covers. Eight reusable shoe and boot covers. Uh, co- 90. Huh? Kohler. 90 Pure seconds. Tide the elongated bidet toilet seat. Orfeld cordless <coughs> vacuum cleaner. I had to cough all the vacuum dust around. Uh, record washer system by Spin Clean. You can actually wash your records and get rid of the hisses and the pops. Keurig K Mini Coffee Maker, Wall Beard Trimmer, Brooks Saddles Perforated Leather Tape with Cork Plugs, Wee Wee uh, High Arc Kitchen Faucet, Lucky Brand Men's what? Straight Jeans, 200 Woe Star Nitrile Disposable Gloves, Thinks Organic Cotton Bikini Period Underwear. It's the apron. It's organic. It. Well, you, you need blood to flow into it's organic. percent checking in. Persona 5 Strikers for PlayStation 4 was purchased. And finally, someone got themselves Blue Buffalo no. Life Protection Formula Dog Food, presumably for their... 40 seconds. Oh, well, you're going to have to cut this off early. Presumably for their yeah. dog or someone they don't uh, care very much about. That's a good one, Brian. You're going to have to find a new tagline to end this read with. What? Uh, like what? New punchline. I don't know. Continue to read. Or oh, is that okay. it? Was it a short um, week? No, that's it. I, I just kind of uh, made my way through without any interruptions. It actually was kind of nice. Uh, thank you. Thank seconds. you to uh, whoever's compressing their sacroiliac. Sacroiliac. And uh, pardon my juvenile humor, but uh, tickles a place in my teenage brain. So good luck with your sacroiliac brace. I wonder if... Uh and the read's done. I wonder if that's a, a, a biker or somebody on a bike, because I know that, that there's a lot of uh, trauma that occurs down there, compression yeah, and whatnot. I uh, see that. You know who else it could be? I wonder. Could have been my wife. She just got herself a Peloton, and now she's uh, on that uh, bike that goes nowhere uh, all the time. Brian, I don't think she has a sacroiliac to care about. I think it's. I, don't, I think that's on males and saying? females. Uh, mm, a sacroiliac. It's between the sacrum what? and the ilium bones on the pelvis. Yeah, it, it's mm. it's like inside the pelvis. It like moves where your legs move. Where your hips move. Hips Ryan? don't lie. Yes. Brian? Here are the movies I've clicked oh, through since the last time me, I talked at me. you. Uh, starting off with, get this. This might be a record for us. Nine people got PG, also known as Psycho, Psycho Gorman. Gorman. Two people. Two people got uh, the Wolf of Snow Hollow. That's weird that uh, they would do that. Maybe because I was talking so much about Thunder Road, which you can see on Amazon. Two people got the climb. 
Smart move. The Invisible Man was clicked through as well as The Apartment. Fuck yeah. Fuck the yes. National Lampoon's European Vacation. Limitless. Fuck the yes. uh, Lust for Life. Encino Man. The Traveler. Time Traveler's Wife. I have not seen. Grandma's Boy. What? Love Actually. Life is Beautiful. The Guns of Navarone. I have not seen. The Taken of Pella. One, two, three. Fuck to the yes. Let's only hope and pray that it was the Ridge with the Walter Matthau. Uh, we're going to have to pause here because I just lost my uh, notes. I just put. I, I clicked. I clicked on the uh, the the dreaded X by a Let mistake, buy you some time. and now I have Let to buy reopen. You some, no, buy you some I time and say that I'm back, oh, but okay. I was gonna say I think what Go happened ahead. was the Wolf of Snow Hollow was a nineteen dollar rental because I was looking into renting it for the longest time, like eh, twenty bucks, and it looks like it came down to about five bucks. So maybe a couple people jumped on that. All right, just, just a it was, theory, a tw- it was just one a of those twenty dollar rentals. It, it was for a while for sure, because I was looking I into watching and I was like, oh, twenty bucks. Here are the movies. Oh no, where'd it go? <laughs> Not again. Oh, come on, Cowan. Not again is right. What? What? I just I can buy you some time and explain it. Hey, no, no. Lust for Life and Cena Man. I said that. Grandma's Boy, Love Actually. Life is Beautiful. Guns and Iron. Take a look. The Black Cat. Uh, the Lobster. Blade, Blade Runner 2049. Blumhouse is Truth or Dare. Relaxer. Fuck to the yes with the Relaxer. Spider Man. Far from Home. Ford versus Ferrari. The Greatest Showman. Eternal Beauty, uh, The Planters, Cajillionaire, Cajillionaire. I still got to see that Cajillionaire. Unhinged was clicked through as well as The Crudes, A New Age. Two people got the dissident, fuck the S. Rob Zombie Triple Feature, Unrated, Martyrs, and The Future Bites, uh, Kill Bill 2, Movie Collection. I did not hit oh, the post. I'm far from far the post. From post. Let's get back to, to the program. <laughs> Time for Anderson to wrap up our flick questions by explaining us, explaining to us, that this one and a half films he has to flick us. Yeah, so they're both docu series limited uh, docu series. Thank you for joining us. This is one is Film Vault. <laughs> one is uh, uh, available in its entirety right now. You can watch it. And I meant to mention it, give, at least give it a mention last week. I just didn't get to it because uh, the show is so chock full, jam packed of uh, good info, Brian. But uh, it's got a clunky name. Uh, most people will know it as the Cecil Hotel documentary or the Hotel Cecil documentary. Uh, its full name is Crime Scene, colon, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel. And it is fascinating. Uh, many people probably remember, like I do, Brian, perhaps you do. Uh, let me ask you, do you remember that news story about that woman who was staying at a hotel in downtown LA and she disappeared? Oh, yeah, she to found, be found it in like a water tank or something. Yes? Yes. Uh, it is that story, mm. but not only that story, it is, so her name is Alisa Lamb. Was she, was she and Asian? She, yeah. she was Asian. She's from Vancouver. Uh, she went on like her first big girl trip. Yeah. And she was uh, by herself. Did like a, like a, like a. All right. All right. Oh. All right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you already, you already said as much. Okay. I don't, Sorry. you don't, we don't need to go any further. For those of you who may not know, like that, this movie, this, this docu drama series limited series four episodes each one is about 54 minutes on netflix and uh it it would really pack a wall up if you didn't know so we already kind of gave a lot away because i'm assuming that not everybody so knows what's the title the, again Sorry, the story again. so it's uh crime scene the vanishing at the cecil hotel evidently crime scene is going to be or already is i'm Brian? here you're facetiming me uh, right now no i don't want like, this i don't want this go away Get out. Decline. I just declined you. I just declined your call. You were trying to FaceTime me, Brian. Settle that? down. And, Got your pants on? That's weird. You know, no, I was, Pull your I was britches trying up, to, Brian. I'm I don't want to do that Google right now. crime scene. Okay, so uh, this called crime scene, the vanishing at the Cecil Hotel. So, yes, she's from Vancouver, and she's on her, her first, like, you know, alone trip, and she's uh, going to see Southern California. Uh, actually, the whole West Coast, I think she had uh, designs of going up to uh, San Francisco at one point as well. But uh, she spent some time down in San Diego, and then she ended up, uh, her last stay, unfortunately, was at this place called the Cecil Hotel, which to say that it has a checkered past is not doing it justice. Uh, and I did not know uh, uh Beyond, I'd never really heard of the hotel Cecil. No, never. I'd been, I dri- I'd driven by it, 
uh, you know, just from perusing Los Angeles from time to time, downtown LA. For those of you who live outside of LA, it's uh, downtown LA is a weird spot. It's not really a place that you go if you live here in LA. You, there's many people who born and raised in LA, never been to downtown LA. There's very few things to do. Now that's changed a little bit over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, it's, it's been uh, um, gentrified to an extent. Like there wasn't a supermarket in the downtown region for 50 years wow. until Ralph's finally went in yeah, there by, recently. By but US, they go into right, that. USC, I frequented that one. There's a brief history of LA's Skid Row, which is fascinating. I would like to see an entire documentary told by this uh, uh, Skid Row historian who is uh, one of the talking heads in this docu docuseries, uh, just hearing about more about uh, LA's Skid Row. It's Did you know that it's 58 square blocks, Skid That's Row? That's impossible. 58 blocks? 58 square blocks. Yeah. I mean, they show the full map and they go into the what? politics behind it and why, no why the authorities and the powers that be made it kind of an off limits, like a oasis haven for uh, people who are, are home deprived. And wait, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm I sorry. Mean, they didn't are go into the hotel is 58 blocks. No, I'm talking about Skid oh, Row. God, I, was, I was so Skid confused. Row. I'm like, that's there's a, impossible. Oh, there's okay. a brief history okay. of Skid Row. So Cecil, Hotel Cecil, is smack dab in the middle of this uh, of Skid Row, which is maybe the most dangerous place in the world. I mean, they say that it's the most violent, dangerous spot in the country. And if you're the most dangerous spot in the country of the United States, which is known for the yeah. violence, uh, it might be one of the most dangerous spots in the world. Uh, you know, save for those you know countries that are amidst civil war and whatnot in Syria and like, but it's it's very unsafe. I don't like my wife, who is a uh, she's a social worker. Like she has to spend time. She she used to she used to have to do outreach and stuff. I did not oh, like boy. that at all. Anyhow, so Apparently Hotel Cecil smacked dab in the Barton middle. Barton Fink for the hotel in Barton Fink. Yeah. It's been there uh, since like the twenties. I think they started building it in the eighteen and nineteen eighteen somewhere along. It's 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 over a hundred years old now. Or it's closing in on that, I believe. It was there for the the Great Depression, and uh, it kind of became a flop house uh, from that time forward. And uh, a lot of low income housing. There's actual apartment buildings in there now, and all sorts of things have been going on uh, for decades in that hotel. Um, very very odd things. Uh, Ugly things. Here's an example. Here's a prime example. I did uh, a quick little uh, rundown of that Night Stalker, Tiller Russell uh, docuseries mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, uh, all about Richard Ramirez. Uh, in the 80s, Brian, uh, there was a resident of Hotel Cecil. Uh, he lived on the 14th floor, I believe it was, and he was paying $14 a night for his room. He lived there. He called it home. And he would routinely come home, uh, go to the in, the in the parking lot of the hotel, strip down, uh, to nothing but his underwear, throw away his bloodied clothes, and then walk through the lobby to the elevator and to his room uh, covered in blood. And this happened routinely, the same guy, and no one said anything about it because that was just the Hotel Cecil. And that man turned out to be Richard Ramirez. So it's that kind of place, right? And here we are, modern day. I guess this story took place seven years ago uh, with with Alyssa uh, Lamb. Lamb. And, and she's in this hotel and she disappears. Now the story is told through a lot of obviously uh, talking heads, but also uh, footage, uh, actual surveillance footage from the cops. Uh, a couple of the talking heads are a woman who took over as the manager of Hotel Cecil and she had no idea what she was getting herself into. And she tells an interesting story of what the kind of um, job that she had with the ODs and the... Uh, domestic violence and all of the, the shadiness that goes on in this hotel. And uh, it was also, it's also told uh, via a, a couple that came from England who were staying at the hotel the same week that uh, this, uh, that Alyssa Lamb went missing and uh, their experience with their water and whatnot. Uh, they, they tell the whole story. So it's, it's fascinating. It's not that well rated on IMDb. I think it's like in the mid fives did, or something, which kind of surprised me. Did not me. realize this is directed by the man from, uh, who directed the Paradise Lost series. Paradise Lost, both of them. Yeah. He's one of the directors, one of the two directors, Joe, Joe Berlinger. And, uh, this, if you like, don't fuck with cats. It's got a similar vibe to it. It's not as good, but it's got a similar vibe 
to don't fuck with cats, especially with the amateur sleuths that get involved. So here's the story. This this woman, she just vanishes, disappears, right? They, they don't know where she went. She was in the Hotel Cecil, so God knows, because it's literally surrounded by Skid Row. All sorts of things could have happened to this girl. So the cops are looking into it. They're trying to figure it out. They get surveillance footage. They look through hundreds of hours of surveillance footage, and they finally get some some pretty decent footage of her in the ho- in the uh, uh, elevator. Right. That, was, that was famous. Acting, I that was famous uh, footage. She was. It went she was viral. It was erratically. She was acting strangely. She was talking to people that weren't there. She was doing weird movements with her arms, and then the amateur sleuths, because they they the cops couldn't figure. They needed leads, so they they didn't want to do it, but they begrudgingly released it on YouTube, or you know they released it to the outlets to try and get tips. It's like what happened to this woman. And all the amateur sleuths came uh, and, fill, uh, and created this this community, and they all started going through it frame by frame, much like they did with "Don't Fuck with Cats." And uh, it it was um, it was eerie, it was creepy, and you know gives you chills. Uh, at the end of the whole thing, though, it's much more based in reality. I'll say, and it was kind of where I thought it was going to end up is where it ended up. It doesn't it didn't leave the ambiguous like who knows what really happened type thing. Like uh, it's everything's kind of wrapped up and explained. And I, a lot of the time I I want it to be wrapped up and explained, but I kind of wish there was some more mystery with this one. And it's pretty logical by the time everything's said and done as to what happened and why it happened. Uh, But it was very good. It, uh, the wife and I both enjoyed this one quite a bit. If I had to stack them together next to each other, night stalker, uh, docuseries by Taylor uh, Russell, Taylor Russell, or, uh, or this one by Joe Berlinger, I'd go with uh, the Night Stalker. I think Night Stalker was uh, a little more my, my my cup of tea, but both of them are fantastic. I, I highly recommend both if you're looking for something good to watch that's compelling. How many uh, episodes? Is it four episodes? Four episodes. Each one's about 54 minutes. So, uh, you know, for those of you who like the, the true life crime, uh, true, true life crime uh, or have, you know, significant others that like it, uh, this gets a huge thumbs up from uh, the wife and I. All so right. we both like the, those things. And then finally... Um, it's one of four, and they're releasing them once uh, every Sunday on HBO Max. I'm sure you yeah, saw I'm very excited the for this. Uh, trailer for it. Well, not Alan so much excited, but interested. Uh, let me just give you a, a quick heads up. Alan V. Farrow is kind of uh, exactly what you don't want to hear, and it's ugly, and it's awful, and it's... Uh, it's it's told in a much different style than the uh, Michael Jackson um, on interrupted testimony that those two kids gave uh there's definitely more story that's being filled out here with images it's, it's, it's more of a movie than that those were just like almost testimony like it, was, it was like uh testimony yeah uh but it's it's all the gross ugliness that just makes you feel yucky and makes you just kind of sad and depressed and like what the, how do how do these things how do people become so twisted and sick and yes, it is only one side of the story and I've only seen one episode, but I don't even know if I want to see the next three. I just don't know if I want to see the next three. I'm not a giant Woody Allen fan. I like one out of every like four or five of his movies. So it's not even, that's not even the reason. It's just, I don't know if I need to see ugly personal um, crimes. Yeah, I know. I completely agree. I, yeah, I haven't seen enough Woody Allen films to really like, you know, be any kind of authority on his career, but uh I know people who fucking love his movies, and uh, I wonder what this will do to those people. People like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I was doing that while I was watching this. I was imagining, like, what if this was like about Stanley Kubrick or something? It would, it would ruin me. Like, I, it would ruin me. A lot of people identify as like Woody Allen types. Oh my god! And they, you know, they, what they, if- and I understand living and dying with movies. I mean, if anyone understands it, it's I get that, and uh, to to see the pain and. Um, <sighs> just just the, the lives destroyed by his selfishness which y- you get the idea of from one episode if it is true which you're kind of led to believe that it's absolutely true while watching this it's uh it's it's uh very very upsetting if they upsetting. listen to me filmmakers i know some are listening if you make a fucking expose like this about michael bay uh we're gonna have we're gonna have words and there's gonna be an issue I feel like any time you see a Michael Bay movie, he's doing it to himself. <laughs> it's been certainly possible. Alrighty. Are we all wrapped up for this guy? Yeah, you know what else? This uh, this uh, Alan V. Uh, v. v. Uh, uh, Farrow uh, is lacking, Brian. Tell me. 
Levity. Levity. There's very little, very, very few yucks. Very few. I was, I kept waiting for, for the for laughs. Guy who, for like, a guy who makes exclusively comedies. Yeah. This is about Woody Allen. Where are the laughs? Give me some laughs. But, uh, yeah, I was hoping that it was going to be a little bit like he said, she said, and like, you know, who knows? Like, at least for the opening episode, I was hoping that like they, they would leave some, some doubt. There's no, I mean, it just goes for the jugular, like right off the bat. Like, this man is a monster. These are the things that he did. These are the people that he hurt. Uh, more next episode. More well, to come. Speaking of the next episode, it is a uh, robust topic. We have uh, the cup overflow with once again. Top five cold opens is what Brian's referring to. Uh, shocking that we uh, somehow missed this. We we just, both of us just assumed that we had already done it. And it was... Uh, it was lengthy research. We'll we'll talk about it next week. It was delightful research, though. I I definitely uh, sacrificed sleep uh, in order to make sure that I uh, not only had good ones, but made sure that they were actually uh, cold opens. Because yeah. there were some that I thought of as cold opens in my head, went back, realized they weren't and then, at and all. And they'll so sneak we'll they'll, talk about they'll all sneak that. a title in you uh, on you there, like at the very beginning. You're like, fuck, not a cold open. Hey, one last thought that uh, before we leave here is uh, something we didn't touch on. Uh, with uh, Judas and Black touch on Messiah, little Woody Allen talk. Yeah, I'm sorry, we didn't uh, hit on. Oh man, we didn't grapple. Oh, we didn't um, seduce. Mm, we didn't. No, I don't know why we would seduce on the fact that Martin Sheen was distractingly bad. Yeah, he no? was. He was a, a, the, unnecessary. The only element of the movie that felt TV movie ish was Martin Sheen. Yeah, just like. Let him just be Martin Sheen. Take the makeup off of him. It's yeah, just, would we have been wildly one of those distracted? Actors. Like, does everyone know what J. Edgar Hoover looked like? I like Martin Sheen just fine as an actor, but I don't know if he's the type of actor that can embody, you know, uh, whatever kind of suit that he's wearing. Like, he's always going to have those Martin Sheen, uh, you know, right. gestures right. and whatnot. And he was just Martin Sheen in a weird a suit. Weird mask. Face suit. Yeah, did not like. Did not like. So what I do like right. is uh, AIDS Monkey. AIDS Monkey good. Artists this week. Uh, check them out at AndersonandBrian.com. That's where you go for our Amazon banner. It's at the top of the site, so check it out. Uh, do us a favor and uh, tap that banner when you're doing your shopping. Uh, AndersonandBrian.com, the website, the Film Vault, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, if you want to uh, let us know what you're watching, want to uh, get on the listener uh, fan flictions, and uh, Anderson and Brian is the Instagram handle. Thank you to our Patreon listeners. Uh, huh. Yes, oh, yes. Brian, let me let me Please. let me cut you off. I, I screwed up last week, but it was a good week to screw up on because we had such a busy week. But uh, short, speaking short of, week, if you week. if you'd like a short week, uh, Brian Klosterman is uh, he's up. He's it's time for us to pay off his second uh, assign us a movie because uh, he is he's been with us for that long uh, on on Patreon, and he has assigned both of us, you and I, The Guilty. It's a 2018 Danish uh -huh. film. Uh -huh. The Guilty uh -huh. will be Flickfest. Flickfest by you and I, thanks to Brian. Oh my God, I did it, Byron. I knew Byron, I do it because I got the dyslexia. All right, Byron Klosterman. I, I'm sorry, Byron. We've talked before. I know your name's Byron. I was, uh, uh -huh. Byron. Not Brian, Byron. Thank God you don't have Brian's hey. name, because then you'd be the even better, better Brian. And there's too many better Brian's. Well, all the Brian's confused. are really the better Brian. If you think about it. All right, that is a so the guilty streaming the on guilty. Hulu. So if you want to watch it along with us, by all means, the guilty will be flick fest uh, next week. The next week, yes, or is that we're doing it? Right. Yes, next week. Next week. Uh, next week in the sisters. meantime, thank you to Giovanni, Jordan Wolf, Mitch Burns, and of course Mike Cole for all your help. We appreciate it. And until next time. We do it for Van Gogh.